I'm really happy that uh, this afternoon, early afternoon, at least, Todd Gannon is with us. He's a relatively new voice at SciArc, and one I think that we're unpacking as he comes along with us on our journey to teach and to learn about architecture and its various discussions. I think one of the things that, that becomes a mandate for every young practitioner, and um, Todd is certainly one of those, is to try to unpack what it means to participate in an architectural culture that in some ways but quickly becoming post eisenman post kipnis like where other kinds of subjects necessarily become part of a discussion that was abandoned long ago to reimagine them maybe in a more fruitful way. So for a one poll, for example, the discussion of materiality and what that means in the figures of screen making, and then the other, the discussion of physicality, which are both in a kind of problematic sense in the realm of architecture, profound and indelible to the task of what architects also think about. Todd comes to us from Columbus University. It's a renowned institution for uh, the role that some of those figureheads have played in defining architectural discourse. And in some ways, killing the father is probably the order of first business for everybody that graduates from a school such as Columbus. Uh, maybe one of the ways they anticipated that is by practicing a sacrilegious act maybe in the time that you were at school, but really evocative one to me. It's one of the main provocations that requires or at least suggests an act of resistance for a practitioner to simultaneously be in the midst of the monster's belly. Each one conceptually organizing, thinking, and arguing for what is architecture, but differently. So I'd like to welcome Todd. I'd like to find out more about how you manage this kind of twinning of your own head and to wish you all the best as you work with us this year. Young and the Restless. And, um, you know, I was flattered to be invited not only because Renee considered me to be young, but of course we know young and architecture is completely dead. Um, but, but also, I was really intrigued by this idea of restlessness in, in architecture. So, this afternoon, I want to speak with you guys about a few ideas, buildings, and writings that have been making me restless for the last 15 years or so. Uh, some of them are mine, some of them are by others, and most of them are collaborations. Um, so to begin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of restlessness, in particular its intimate relationship to attention. Uh, from there, I'll speak a bit more about the conversion of attention into obsession. Uh, being obsessed, I think, is a really key operative strategy among architects, uh, young and old, and I'm convinced that it's absolutely necessary to all forms of practice and probably to this twinning of your subjectivity that, that Chris alluded to. Uh, so from there, I'll tell you how I've been pursuing some of my personal obsessions and a series of projects and writings that date back to my graduate school days at Ohio State. Um, so now today, I spend most of my time in academic research, writing, and teaching. But uh, again, as Chris mentioned, I spent most of my career uh, in the building industry. And much of that was uh, with a firm called ACOC Associates Architects of Columbus. Um, and while I was there, from I guess 97 to 04, 05, um, I had this incredible opportunity, pretty much straight out of school, to take the lead on what eventually resulted in 60 built projects in the span of seven years. Uh, so, and those ranged from small scale condominium interior build outs to uh, 170,000 square foot headquarters for uh, Limited Two, which is now Justice. But anyway, so little buildings, big buildings, lots of stuff. It was an incredibly amazing time. It had a pace that I'm pretty sure none of us are going to see again for quite a while. Um, and it was one where I really learned more than I can say. So today I'm going to just share some of the highlights of that experience. Um, now, the talk won't be completely devoid of theoretical speculation. I was teaching that entire time and spending a lot of time with Kipnis uh, and others who were kind of floating through Ohio State. So um, that certainly inflected my approach significantly. Um, now, also being young, we can assume that I'm still somewhat naive and willing or prone to making outlandish claims. Uh, and so along the way, I'm going to attempt to define architecture, which, you know, should be no problem. Uh, I'll explain why material and media 
why materials and media matter, and if you hang around to the end, then I'll try to give an idea of why it's such a good time today, even with the economic crunch, to be on the day. Um, so we'll start with restlessness. The young are often associated with restlessness. Mine is a generation seemingly incapable of sustained attention. And for those younger than myself, prognosis is even worse. If the more pessimistic scholars, scientists, and pundits are correct, humankind is going to be incapable of basic cognition within a few generations. Now, as you may have guessed, it's the rampant explosion of media that usually takes the blame. In the last 20 years, we've seen an unprecedented proliferation of new media with personal computers, video games, iPod, cell phones, and all that stuff, entering not just the workplace and the home, but also significantly into the space of little kids' bedrooms. Um, in the span of the, in the same 20 years that I've been doing architecture, we've also witnessed a steady rise in reported cases of competitive stress disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome and cognitive problems such as attention deficit disorder. Um, now, in a recent study, <coughs> Catherine Hales pointed out that Ritalin, the drug that's most often prescribed to, to combat ADD, is not a tranquilizer. Uh, Ritalin doesn't work by calming kids into a more contemplative state. Tranquilizers, in fact, make the symptoms worse. Instead, Ritalin is a cortical stimulant. It increases brain activity. In someone with ADD, Hales writes, normal stimulation is felt as boredom, and relatively high levels of stimulation are required for the child to be in, feel engaged or interested. Uh, Ritalin provided the additional stimulation chemically, taking the place of misbehaving, fidgeting, and other forms of restlessness. Now, Hales goes on to define two kinds of attention. Deep attention and hyperattention. And here are her definitions. Uh, deep attention, the cognitive style traditionally associated with the humanities, is characterized by concentrating on a single object for long periods, say a novel by Dickens, ignoring outside stimuli while so engaged, preferring a single information stream and having a high tolerance for long focus times. Hyperattention, by contrast, is characterized by switching focus rapidly between tasks, preferring multiple information streams, seeking high levels of stimulation, and having low tolerance for boredom. Today, Hales continues, kids as well as adults tend, to tend much more toward this latter condition. What's more, the media-saturated contemporary context actually causes physical chains, changes in the neural compositions of our brains. This happens through something called synaptogenesis, a process through which neural connections in highly stimulated areas of the brain strengthen and grow, while those in understimulated areas decay and disappear. I'm told this process is represented in these diagrams, which you can see uh, is pretty good, right? In the space time of neural composition. But so in a week, that green thing grows, and then in a day, dots appear. But you can see the kind of neural synapse translating from one side to the other. More simply, the process kind of goes like this. Uh, this also demonstrates the sort of graphic sensibility of the <laughs> neuroscientific community. <laughs> Um, so from, from this process of synaptogenesis, uh, Kate draws the following conclusions. Although synaptogenesis is greatest in infancy, plasticity continues throughout childhood and adolescence, with some degree continuing even into adulthood in contemporary developed societies. This plasticity implies that brain synaptic connections are co-evolving with, with environments in which media consumption is a dominant factor. Children growing up in media-rich environments literally have brains wired differently than humans that did not come to maturity in such conditions. So, in other words, the kid on the left has a different brain than the kid on the right. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, as Hale, Stephen Johnson, and many, many others argue. Both deep attention and hyperattention have their merits. Ask any brain surgeon or hockey and they can tell you all about it. But the increased stimuli of contemporary mediated society has all of us tend to poor hyperattentiveness. And that's true as much for the great schooler playing guitar hero while text messaging as it is for architects young and old who routinely juggle practice, teaching, writing, and a host of other endeavors. Now architects also have been at the cutting edge of employing multiple media and incorporating new technology into our endeavors. And here are some of our advances in technology from the past. I'm particularly interested in the way architects divide their attention among the, array, the array of media that we employ. And much of my recent research has been focused here. Andy. Um, Doctor. 
<laughs> nurse. <laughs> Don't you're going to get me in trouble. That's right. <laughs> Believe your PhD. Uh, much of my research has been focused here in this kind of media environment. Uh, so for each of the specific media we work with and through, drawings, buildings, writing, photographs, digital models, even conversations, come with specific opportunities and constraints that must be taken seriously. Now architecture, like literature, here's the big theory of literature, is an embodied art form. And while the two disciplines sometimes overlap in their mechanisms for making, storing, and transmitting information, neither can be reduced solely to the physical objects, all those books and buildings, that we so often associate with them. So literature is not books, and architecture is not buildings. Rather, architecture and literature are born of the complex dynamic feedback loops and develop, that develop between objects, the subjects that perceive them, and the specific cultural context within which these interactions take place. Architecture is that which makes buildings meaningful to an ongoing disciplinary tradition, but it's not the buildings themselves. Rainer Bannon put this far more simply when he said, architecture is not what is done, but how it's done. So in this sense, we can understand architecture as an emergent property, a virtual condition that issues from the interaction between actual subjects, objects, and contexts. Each of these three components carries with them specific characteristics that inflect the meanings that arise from interaction. While architecture's objects can take many forms, its discourse is constructed in terms of language. Translated into language, the varied social and cultural events that arise from the intersection between subject, object, and context constitute the discourse. So architecture, I believe, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to on this, is a function of embodied discourse. That is, discourse instantiated in speech, or more typically in written, graphic, and built documents. The document, as the term is used in textual studies, and I, as, a, as I'm using it here, is distinct from text, project, or work because it implies the existence of the physical object. That object is the key. For ideas to matter in the world, they need to be embodied in the material. That embodiment, the documents of architecture, can take many forms. It can be a particular deformation of air particle organization that we understand as speech, it can be the specific chemical interactions of ink on paper that we know as print. It can come from the binary flux of electronic circuits and LED pixels we call digital media. Or it can be found in the old-fashioned arrangement of construction materials in the world that we call building. Through our interaction with these documents and the ideas that adhere within them, we get architecture. So from all that, we might understand that architecture itself is a form of ADD. Architecture is made from documents and discourse. That is, the things that we say about the things we make are just as important as the things themselves. To participate in the cultivation of the discipline, we need to be willing and able to move through an array of media. We need to make a lot of stuff, and we need to have a lot of stuff to say about that stuff. And to do that, we need to be something more than restless, more than attentive. We need to be obsessed. Now, for several years at Ohio State, this incredible opportunity to uh, examine the obsessive tendencies of some of the most important and well-known minds of the discipline. From 1996 to 2006, I was uh, one of the moderators of, of Ohio State's answer to Inside the Actor Studio, the Baumer Memorial Seminars. Uh, now you can see James Lipton had a way nicer set than we had, but we had better guests. So here's Jock and Jock Herzog and Liz Diller. Um, now, each year we invited several practitioners to participate in prolonged multi day interrogations conducted by myself, Jeff Kippers, and uh, with the participation of the six year graduate studio. And from these interactions, we produced a series of books that I edited uh, Source Books and Architecture. Here you can just get another idea of the sort of multimedia world that I tend to live in with books and construction documents and all that junk. And a mainline, by the way. I still use fairly regularly because I'm weird. Um, now, in these books, you'll find extended interviews with Tom Maine, Bernard Schumann, Ben Ben Berkman, Carolyn Bowes, Stephen Hall, Zaha Hadid, Max Scoggin, and Meryl Elam, Peter Eisen. Uh, and the little book that we did on Dwayne and Jenny uh, recently is very much follows that model. Um, now, at OSU, we also spoke with uh, Liz Diller and Jacques Herzog, and also with Wolf Pricks. And the series continues to go on, but they haven't produced any more books, which kind of makes I don't know why that makes me feel good. Uh, now, for me, though, more than anything, what was interesting was to witness how, without fail, 
each of those architects nurtured specific obsessions that they carried with some consistency into their own projects. For Bernard, each project was conceived in terms of the event. For Tom Main, it was an incessant concern for the status of the ground that kind of marked the works. For Steve Hall, we see consistent analogies to, to science and phenomenology. Zaha talked nothing but fluidity and movement, and Merkel was all about the diagram, etc. etc. Now, I don't intend to reduce these practices to elaborations on single concepts. That's not the case at all. But rather, I want to point that these singular obsessions inflected the way that each practice approached the myriad problems that arise in an architectural project, and that these inflections play a very large part in constructing the professional persona of the architects as well as the particular attitudes of the projects. So, for instance, uh, Diller's Cofidio's Blur Building is intimately entangled with, with Liz and Rick's fascination with and suspicion of contemporary regimes of opticality and surveillance. Herzog and Demeron's signal box brings an interest in, uh, in materiality and exquisite construction to the unlikely site of a railroad yard. Um, so these projects can be seen as you know, examples of these ongoing obsessive agendas. Now, I could easily spend the rest of my time today telling you about the obsessions of these architects, but I'd prefer if you went and bought the books and read about them yourself, so please do that. I won't make any money, but it'd be nice if the books were out there anymore. Uh, but instead, I want to tell you a little bit about my own obsessions. Uh, I went to school at Temple University in Philadelphia from 1989 to 92. I took a year off work in construction, uh, mostly concrete and brick after that, and then went to Ohio State from 93 to 97, where I got my um, undergraduate and graduate degrees. Now, it was a weird time, and at both of those institutions, at Temple, every single teacher I had, bar none, had worked for Robert Venturi at some point in his career. And at Ohio State, almost all of them had worked with or been a student of James Sterling. So, I mean, I was trained by postmodern formalists to grow up in uh, Now, in a weird way, I, I also went to Sire. Uh, my final year at o OSU, um, my studio instructors in the fall were Ming and Craig, uh, then Wes Jones in the winter, and then Kipnis in, in the spring. So I had this kind of weird proto sire uh, thing as well. And just because I thought it would be funny, I dragged a couple of really old projects out of the box that it had been rolled up in for like I don't know how long. Uh, but this was a media tech that I did on Hollywood Boulevard for Craig and Ming around 1995 and 96. You can see this is what renderings look like. <laughs> and now this is actually constructed perspective. I don't know why I put Dobie Gillis in there, but it was a media tech. The idea was that you took the marquee and dragged it through the building, and that provided the circulation system. Um, but really, the elaboration of the project came almost exclusively in the form of plans. I mean, this thing was very much, and sections, but this was very much a meditation on things like La Tourette, and the Acropolis, you could see when it came to you know, articulating the specifics of the bar, it was kind of copy from Malini. Um, but, but it was really the elaboration of plans that made this thing go, a study of the circulation as you moved up through the building. And this is probably most clear in this uh, Sterling-esque drawing uh, that studied the circulation, taking you up from the street across the series of platforms, and then turning around and accessing the two theaters, which you can see in maybe in these little doorways there, and then you took a route back down into the media tech below. So I mean, the project was really concerned with organizing this sort of complex uh, circulation route. And as you can see, that this was a pretty abstract undertaking. This was pretty different from the way we operate today. Um, and despite my you know, uncanny rendering abilities, plans and sections were really what, what made the project go. Um, and so another thing for us that that became a key tool were these sorts of conceptual diagrams. Um, now these ones here were produced by Doug Graff, another influential teacher at Ohio State. Uh, on the near screen, we can see his incessant geo geometrical elaborations of, reading of readings out of very simple four-square arrangements. So we see perimeters giving rise to the center, centers giving rise to edges, edges turning into modules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you put these things to work, you can do neat tricks like turn the plots of Farnese down there on the bottom, into the Villa Savoie on top through a series of stages that passes through the Stoa Battles. So, <clears throat> it's a pretty good trip, right? Um, oops. Now you know where we're going. <clears throat> now, this was an incredibly potent method for understanding architecture. 
And it's a method that I still maintain enormous faith in, but it is susceptible to certain blind spots. And these analytical methods encourage me to keep build the buildings themselves, the brick and mortar documents of architecture, a little bit at arm's length. Plans and sections, as I said, the printed documents of architecture, were what matter primarily to the exploration. And what happened, I think, to me, and for many of my generation, but never, by the way, to Sterling or Venturi or Doug Rath, was that we kind of lost touch or became really distanced from the physical aspects of building. And now, I became acutely aware of this blind spot when I went and saw Terry Riley's exhibition, Like Construction, uh, in 1995 or 6, whenever it opened. I mean, the weird thing was, I mean, I'm a bit of a motor mouth now, I was then, and I went to the show and realized that I didn't have anything to say about it about the exhibition. I, the work in the show, which was really cool, Haas, Herzog, Demeron, Ravel, Sejima, Zuntor, it was, seemed totally resistant to the formalist analytical tools that I was equipped with. And so while I was enamored with the work, I was completely incapable of engaging it in a meaningful way. I wasn't the only one who felt this way, and the whole situation was fascinating. So I began to study the show pretty carefully, and I discovered that what Terry was trying to do was document a shift in attention in the discipline from one mode of thinking to another. He noticed that, that at a time when most of us were very interested in plans and sections like this, as Peter Eisman said, our off center, a group of architects were emerging primarily out of Central Europe that were producing plans like this. So it, kind of a big shift. So Riley termed this a shift in sensibility. And in his catalog essay, he described in detail how problems of form gave way to problems of surface. And now the shift also didn't happen in just buildings. We saw at that time a shift in discourse away from certain linguistic paradigms into a more materialist approach, what Kipnis has termed a shift from a Derridian to Deleuzian discourse. So there were all kinds of things shaking up. And I became as obsessed with these building changes as with these discursive shifts. And Jeff, who was my studio instructor at the time, encouraged me to nurture these obsessions. And the eventual result was the publication of Light Construction Reader, um, which I would imagine some of you see that talk about a little bit more. Now, in all of this talk, you probably recognize the influence of Colin Rowe. And I'm sure you all remember his famous essay, Transparency, Literal, and Phenomenal, which he wrote with Anna Robert Slutsky in the 1950s. This was a key text in setting up the intellectual environment receptive to the kind of deep reading necessary to appreciate projects like the Arnold Center and basically the underwrote my education of state. Now, in that essay, of course, Roman Slutsky took two very similar-looking paintings, one by Picasso and one by Miller, and made them look very different. The Picasso was cast as a clearly defined see-through figure in a deep space, and the Baroque is a complex and ambiguous arrangement that supports multiple readings in shallow space. The first was a case of literal transparency. The second, a case of much more interesting now, Roman Slutsky then transported these painterly terms into architecture and convinced more than a generation, actually, that Le Corbusier's Villa Stein displayed a rich and ambiguous and multiple catalog of readings just like Baroque's Portuguese, while Grobius' Bauhaus, with its simple, literally transparent curtain wall, lumped together with Picasso's literal, literal clarinet player, could offer up just one reading of the transparent thing. <coughs> now, Roman Slutsky's argument relied on a linguistic ambiguity within the text as much as it relied on the visual ambiguity of the buildings that they described. At the outset, they write, transparency may be an inherent quality of surface, as in a wire mesh or glass curtain wall, or it may be an inherent quality of organization. As their argument plays out, it becomes clear that they favor, quite specifically, organizational or phenomenal transparencies over material, literal ones, uh, intent on a Uncovering configurational ambiguities, they disparage what they call the haphazard superimpositions provided by the accidental reflections of light playing on a translucent and polished surface, which you would find that the balance. Now, in this whole argument, what's important here is that for Rowan Slutsky, what a building is made of is of absolutely no consequence to the argument. Any material will do as long as it can be unequivocally categorized as solid or void, which is why they make no comments in the class at uh, Bill Stein. Now, 40 years later, Riley worked in his catalog essay to provide an alternative point of view that took seriously the nature of specific materials, literal transparency, and how those materials react in the physical context of the world. 
In the Light Construction Reader, we assembled and republished not only Roman Slutsky's essays, but also the work, some works by Rosemary Bletter, Bob Sowell, Donald Burtons, Rosalind Krauss, Jeff Kipnis, and many others, that took specific issue with Roman Slutsky's position. While these writings differ greatly in content and character, certain affinities percolated to the surface. All were bound up with the problem of legibility, of architectural form as a language of code. All took issue with Rowan Slutsky's object bias and their insulation of those objects from the particularities of experience, temporality, or mood. And all criticized their tendency to play favorites, to stack the deck in favor of cubism, like Boussier, formalism, typology, political neutrality, and ultimately historicism. Now, light construction called for a shift away from these tendencies. And if the show was a collection of built documents that demonstrated Riley's shift in sensibility, the reader was an attempt to collect the written documents that corresponded to that shift. It attempted to provide the discursive counterpart to the exhibition. Now, at the same time that I was gathering and studying the discursive materials that eventually, after a really long time, became the light construction reader. Come on. Um, we were testing these ideas in a series of projects in the graduate studio. Uh, and the first one that I want to show you is this wax wall, which was conceived by Ms. Siddiqui, who was sitting right there, and then executed by the, the entire graduate studio. We kind of emptied out our studio and built this big wall. Um, and you can see here some of those ideas that we were trying to, trying to get at. The suppression of formal complexity that has been driving most of our projects. There was, uh, which, you know, so we stripped the project down to a simple grid. Uh, we were really working to study a full range of, uh, of sensations, so the, the kind of tactility of this thing, the smell of it, the various atmospheric effects, the fact that it attracted bees in an unbelievable way. It really, the studio was full of bees. Um, but what we, we also kind of played around with this thing, so it was a weird double wall where we could get behind it, and at one point we strung strings back behind there, put some fans underneath, and got this weird kind of transparent, it almost looked like static across there as these strings sort of fluttered behind the, uh, the wax itself. Uh, in another instance, we, we attempted to kind of apply an image across the, across the facade. And so you can see it just, this was a sort of an operation of kind of uniform relaxation of the image. The image that we started with was, uh, of course, this famous one of the race car which had already been appropriated by Bruce Mao in the cover of the Bergson, Bergsonism book. And you can kind of see an even more relaxed trace of that image inhabiting the facade here. So, and then we, we also built this um, school of fish stuff, which is another story that we'll talk about some other time. Uh, but but we, you know, so you can see that the, 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 the studios itself, they, we really kind of shifted into sort of full scale material investigations, which were a whole lot of fun and made your hand hurt less than all that traffic. Uh, now, so then I graduated, and um, while I was waiting for a job, because the place where I wanted to work, all these, all the desks were full, and I had to wait for Katsumi, who was working at the office at the time, to move out here so I could take his desk. So there's another kind of weird sire connection there. Um, so I moved into Katsumi's place, but before I was able to do that, I. Uh, really lucked out, and with a friend of mine, we got to build this little building out in um, southern Ohio. And so once again, if the, if the wax wall was, a, was an opportunity to explore these sort of material sensibilities in a single surface, the pavilion was an opportunity to explore the three dimensions. Um, so if we look at the drawings, you can see again the form was quite stripped down, clearly influenced by, you know, we were looking at Mies van der Rohe, obviously, uh, especially in the relationship with the ground. Glenn Burkett was very hot at the time, which I think you can see very clearly. Um, but, but what we were interested in was, A, build, designing something that we could actually build with our own hands, which we eventually did, but also figuring out how we could play with the patterning of the slats to produce this sort of graduated effects that would interact with the screens that enclose the three bays nearest to me. And, and provide a, a kind of range of visual effects. So you can start to see those opening up in the built work as the various shadows interact with the real, or you know, the, the kind of actual wood slats and reflect off of the different screens. Uh, you can maybe see that a little, a little bit here where it actually, the facades took on a kind of diagonal organization despite the fact that there were no diagonals. 
Um, and in the interior especially, we became really interested and we spent eons like putting different kinds of screen inside and figuring out which one did the right thing. And we became very interested in the kind of exaggeration of depth when the window, the door was open versus the almost suppression of depth that we see in where the screens are kind of doubled up over each other. So, so the, the project, that it wasn't obviously these, these, these uh, visual effects weren't the only idea, but they were very much driving some of the constructional experiments. And it was also just fun to be out the woods swinging hammers all summer. So it was a really great fun. Uh, and then of course at night, you know, the, all of these effects were reversed and it would become this like, glowing uh, lantern. It was just out in the middle of nowhere, so it was really kind of fantastic. The guy that lived next door used to sit on it early in the morning and poach deer, uh, like all year round. It was, it was like that. He's would arrive, you come on his horse, and you're up on a ladder, and you think a horse would stick his face in it, in your face. So it was out there. Um, I'm not sure if it's still there. Anyway, um, not long after that, I got a regular job and uh, did a whole bunch of projects that we just don't have time to show very many of them. So I want to concentrate on just one, which um, we'll kind of end on. Um, and this is a project for the Columbus College of Art and Design. So Columbus is an answer to Otis, in a way. And, um, and it offered an opportunity to study these material effects in a very simple form, this time in concrete. Um, now, of course, this project was way more than just a uh, sort of material exercise. Um, we were charged with a pretty complex problem of uh, adding to a, to a college campus that had almost no sort of built presence. Everything that doesn't have a name written on it is a parking lot. And there was just nothing around. And uh, the school had kind of charged us to amplify the campus, which was populated mostly by these fairly stripped down stucco boxes. It has this ridiculous, uh, sorry, not ridiculous, quite nice, uh, statue, I guess you would call it. It's art, obviously. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but mostly it was a, it was a, school, a campus structured by parking lots. Um, and so what we did was to try to reverse the trend and we'd occupy this, this corner in gray up here uh, at two major streets and try to kind of define, we evacuate this parking lot, turn it into a new quadrangle for the school, uh, set up a relationship between the Kanzani Center, which was the major building on campus, and our new project, which would house the student center, some admin administrative functions on the ground floor, and then uh, some studios and, and uh, academic programs on the, on the upper two floors. Now, we had done a little bit of work for CCAD, CCAD in the past. Um, and what, what we typically would do is CCAD would buy an old building in Columbus like this, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, you know, warehouse project, concrete frame, brick and fill with these big windows. And we would go in, strip out the interior, put in new mechanicals, put in new windows, paint the whole thing white, and hand it over. And this was very good. Um, they really liked the studio space because it was indestructible, right? The students couldn't break it, they couldn't wreck it, they couldn't kick holes in drywalls because there wasn't any. And so they asked us to provide them another one of these as the kind of basis of the project. And the weird thing was, um, the budget, which we wound up doing this building for about $85 a square foot, so I mean, we had no money to spend. Uh, so we couldn't afford to do anything anywhere near this robust. And it also seemed a little bit weird to be so nostalgic, right? That, that a, a progressive design school would want to kind of fake it and produce this 19th century uh, loft space. So we, we began to explore, um, you know, how do you build that big, cheap, and durable space today, and we did, did some research and realized the cheapest way you could build in Central Ohio was with these precast off-site panels. Um, so it was decided right then and there that there was a contractor on the board that, that did this kind of work. That's how we're going to go. Um, which is a really great system. You get the exterior finish and the interior finish for free, The interior, as long as you're willing to take room finished concrete as your interior. Uh, there is a little bit of insulation inside. Um, but basically these things, and they're structural, so they can hold up the, the buildings themselves. Now, 
We had the tectonic side of it, but we had no idea what this building was going to look like, and we did this series of incredibly ugly studies to try to sort it out. And you can see, I can't believe I'm showing this to you, but I am. Uh, and you can see we we're trying to mark that corner with some sort of tower element, uh, provide a little arcade at the, at the street level, and then open up with a primarily glazed facade to this new uh, plaza that was going to happen at the, uh, in the place of the former parking lot. Now, nobody was happy with these things. Uh, like everybody was basically like, yeah, these aren't so good. We went through a whole lot of iterations. And we're kind of stumped. At the same time, I, I happened to have been working on a book on Stephen Hall's MIT dormitory. And Steve was also looking at uh, precast concrete, and he was interested in the kind of scale dislocations you would get from this waffle system, and also in this kind of strange um, dissonance between the gridded structure of the facade and these weird, bubbly, um, amorphous spaces that he had using inside the project. So, I mean, this was kind of in our head. It seemed like he was doing something better. We didn't want to do that specifically, but there was something about the grid and a kind of relaxation of the grid and how that related to precast concrete, which we didn't quite have a sense of yet. Um, so one day we're sitting in, a, in the office with the president of CCA, and Danny, there was this photograph of fireworks on the wall. And Danny said, we need something like that. We need something that kind of has that sort of energy. And then he left. Like, well, I don't know. Um, so in a kind of moment of frustration, I took the drawing, scanned it, and you know, did the old filter, pixelate, and you know, pick a good spot. Uh, but went through and, and kind of through a series of relaxations, not unlike the relaxations that we did in the wax wall, uh, developed a non-gridded organization that we then applied to the facade of the building. Uh, we worked it down to three different colors from that initial firework uh, pattern. The two, of the, the two grays became just indentations in the concrete. The, uh, the blacks became windows. And that facade, that became our sort of facade strategy. This was something that we could do very cheaply in the concrete, in the precast concrete. We simply lay sheets of plywood inside the forms. And the nice thing about it, we didn't have to dimension anything. We just sent these five, these AutoCAD files to the builders. They worked out the rebar pattern, which was kind of complicated. And then the panels arrived on site, 12 feet wide, 53 feet tall. Um, so here is the, the kind of renderings, where you can see this kind of pockmark facade wrapping around the corner, trying to kind of get a little bit more uh, transparent as it turns the corner. And then we had this idea that we were going to cut out the bottom to reveal the ground floor program uh, at the corner. Now, since those three sides were going to be astronomically cheap, that allowed us to spend a little bit of money on the south facade so we could build it in curtain wall and span the entire width of the building with this uh, eight foot deep truss yes. at the upper level, which we'll see a little bit more about in a second. So here is just a few of the, well, there's the building. There's the bad uh, And so you can see again the, uh, that big stone cross spanning across the two. Uh, in the face, we had a double height space with uh, student center, coffee lounge, stuff like that. This little porch that poked out through the otherwise depressed facade. Um, and, you know, you can't shake all the postmodernism out of me. So the columns that we eliminated by instituting the trust were put back as these kind of concrete pylons, which had lights in the top to uh, shine up on the underside of the sloping metal surface above. Um, here's just another view of that. The, the back corner. Uh, some detail shots of the facade. Where you can see the, kind of the layers of um, indentations, which really tried to kind of not simply apply an image to this thing, not have anything representational, but it was an attempt to kind of bring some kind of life deep into the, the thickness of the material. Um, now the project itself is incredibly straightforward inside. You can see here it's kind of packed with program. Uh, on the upper levels, you can see the double edge space coming through. And on the upper floor, again, that kind of the slot of programmatic stuff over the edge. And we managed to incorporate this tiered seating at the bottom side of the studio spaces. Um, and we were able to kind of 
pull this thing off, primarily because how we manipulate an incredibly simple section. One of the things that Denny really liked about his old industrial buildings was that they had really tall ceilings, which we couldn't afford typically. Um, but what we did here was we, we just decided we were going to pay the extra money for 16 feet floor to floor, which gave us enough room on the edge of the building that we could stack program and put a mechanical mezzanine at every level. So on the floor itself, you have bathrooms, washrooms, and elevators, and all that junk. And then above, we had uh, the HVAC equipment. The nice thing about it was rather than use rooftop units, which would be expensive with roof penetrations, we used these basically outsized hotel packaged units, three tons each, three per floor, that were through wall on the side facade, blew straight out through. So we had an incredibly simplified mechanical system, which just carved tons of money out of it. And so you can see here, we get these great big open spaces finished entirely in concrete on the upper floor, uh, steel, steel structure at the ceiling on the other two floors of this pre concrete. Very simple mechanically because there's nothing coming down from the roof. And uh, just a little signal, a kind of nod to that, that scale shift on the alley facade where you can see all of the mechanical punctures showing through and demonstrating a kind of six story rather than a three story scheme. Um, Now, if we look at the section in the other direction, go back to the section, we can see that the cut out at the ground floor, the, the 16 foot tall, the, 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 that eight foot split on the two levels, we took advantage of again on the upper floor to run that truss across and provide this tiered seating, which gave us this, this kind of built-in jury space at the third level. So we had spaces for small lectures, and it gave a pretty great view back out to the, um, the campus itself. Here I got to take Wolf to see it at one point. But the point of this slide is that the, the, the kind of beefiness of this truss was just fantastic. I mean, these plates were so huge. Um, so here's just another view of the front of the building. Kind of this little papal address porch that I don't think ever got used, but we had a lot of fun saying that that's where Denny would address the student body standing in their new, uh, in their new <coughs> plaza. Uh, and, we, you know, there was very little inside to articulate, so we played around a little bit with these stairs that just kind of shot up through these cavernous spaces. Uh, here's a view of the, the double height space, the secondary structure to reinforce the curved wall, the metal kind of coming in, sloping up above. Uh, and just a real quick semi-animation of how this thing went together, where we back the truck in, lift the panel up over the frame, set it down into place. You can see there the, uh, the plywood insets that, that let us kind of do this thing. And also these additional bits of concrete that we needed to, the, it turns out the engineering forces as you went from horizontal to vertical were kind of, that was the thing you had to fight. And so we had to include a lot of extra concrete, which once we finished, we had to come back in and cut out. So a lot of these corner windows, that we spent actually quite a bit of time I took a lot of photographs of uh, Cutting out these bits of concrete and peeling out all of the stuff and sort of really lovingly um, pulling all this formwork out to produce the final facade. Now, the thing that allowed us to do this really cheaply was, you know, these, facade, these panels are self-supporting. They're about 18 tons a piece. And you can see when they went in, we just set them down on a grave beam. And of course, you know, we wanted to cut out the, all of this stuff afterwards. And the trick was you couldn't just put a saw in it because the concrete that above is so heavy that the 18 tons coming down on the saw blade wouldn't let you cut it. So we wound up having to, in order to achieve this, this kind of floating corner, we set jacks at the second floor level, which allowed us to lift those panels up off the foundation, which allowed them to suspend, they could cut off the bottom, and we just kind of left that as part of the process available and within the studios. Um, so here's just another view of that, of that facade. And also it gave us, I think, the world's best termite barrier, because I mean, there's a gigantic foundation underneath all this stuff that supported those walls for about two weeks. Um, so here's just a couple of gratuitous night shots. Uh, the plaza was designed by somebody else. Uh, so that's, that's CCAD. So just couple more seconds and we'll be all set. Um, 
So hopefully what we've seen here is a somewhat consistent, but obviously a little bit uh, erratic, migration of ideas through various media. Um, we've, seen, we've seen these ideas pursued in texts and exhibitions and in essays by myself and others. We've seen ideas about transparency and material effects and wax walls, wooden sheds, and concrete bunkers. Each of these documents offered a specific way to attack the problem. Wood showed one way to see transparency, wax another, a published essay or computer rendering offered others still. And each iteration changed our understanding of the ones that came before and points opportunities to the ones that come later. Now, media theorists J. David Bolter and Richard Rusin turned, quote, the formal logic by which new media technologies refashion prior media forms as remediation. So if mediation implies the transformations undergone by an object that is represented in a medium, Remediation implies those changes that occur when media themselves cycle through one another, as when architectural ideas move between text drawings and buildings. Now, Bolter and Grusin's work underscores the fact that no medium is neutral, and his interaction between media become more promiscuous as the translation of ideas between varied material instantiations become more frequent. Radical transformations in both the objects we produce as well as the manner in which we produce them are inevitable. While these transformations will almost certainly open up rich possibilities, they also bring with them inherent risks. Some even say, some I'm pretty sure have said it on this stage, that these new media will eventually displace or spell the obsolescence of architecture. Now, I think these guys have it all wrong, and I think, it's a, I think they've got it wrong because they tend to think of architecture as a class of buildings rather than as an emergent effect. Now, the claim that architecture will become obsolete in the face of technology, or as Victor Hugo put it in 1831, this will kill that, has been made incorrectly so many times through history that it fascinates me that anybody is still willing to make it. I would argue instead that these media, these very media, are what make architecture more important than ever. We think of the pressing issues in culture today, or in cultural studies today, the embodiment of information and materials and the problem of translating them between them, the specific inflections produced by various media, alternative modes of spatial organization, how to design and inhabit a global culture scape, how to adapt and deploy cutting edge technologies, how to foment resistance and opportunity within dominant systems of control. These are just some of the current issues at play in contemporary studies of mediated, of mediated and technological societies, some of the things that media scapes spend a lot of time thinking about. Now, for many uh, fields of cultural inquiry, Many of these problems have just emerged. For architecture, for architects, it really, literally is just another day of the office. Now, media theorist Lev Banovich has proposed that today, culture is, is moving away from a linguistic paradigm of the narrative, or in other words, postmodernism, toward a spatial para paradigm of the database that is being called posthumanism. So in other words, problems in contemporary culture are increasingly shifting away from language toward the domain of architectural thinking. Now, we've got the deepest and richest history in multimedia environments, although we probably didn't notice it until very recently. We pretty much invented contemporary notions of spatiality. We were the pioneers of virtual. And today, the world needs architects more than ever, and that's why it's such a good time, regardless of the current economic crisis, to be one. And anybody that's paying even the slightest attention should be able to see that. So, thanks for listening.